Welcome to this program in the Hour of Finger Lakes History Series. I am Seneca County historian Walter Gable. The topic of this program is our country schools with some fond and not so fond memories. In this quote from Eric Sloan in his 1972 book, he points out that there's more of a difference between schools today and country schools than just simply architectural styles. He points out that society has changed and the way schools are operating has uh, tried to deal with that change. And he's not very positive about uh, the change that has taken place. The country school was a very familiar institution in rural America until about 1940, when many school districts, especially those in New York State, became centralized as we know them. In the case of my home school district of Romulus, it was in 1938 that the Romulus Central School was created as a replacement for a few country schools which were still operating until then. This map shows that Seneca Lake basically marked the western boundary of the new military tract of land that was surveyed and distributed to New York veterans of the Revolutionary War. A provision of the 1789 New York State law creating this new military tract was that within each township in this new military tract, a lot of, 16, of 600 acres could be sold, with the revenues to be used to support the gospel and schools. Not surprisingly, this lot became known as the gospel lot. Each township also had a lot set aside to support literature. For example, the Romulus Township, the gospel lot was not lot number 50 of the 100 lots in that township. The literature lot was number 55 and they're shown on this map. The properties in those gospel and school lots were sold and the money was kept by the state and the interest on the lands after 1820 went exclusively to supporting public schools in New York State. Interestingly, it wasn't until 1958 that the New York State legislature the New York State Education Department liquidated that gospel fund with the remaining monies reverting to the respective local school districts. In 1798, there were 1,352 schools in 23 counties with 59,660 students. It was in 1812 that a state law provided for the organization and establishment of common schools with local or town supervision. In 1849, a law established free school districts as they became known. And in 1856, we started having school superintendents in each county. The first one in Seneca County was Simeon Holton of Seneca Falls. In this slide and in the next few, you're going to see how some of the country school buildings in Seneca County continue to function as residences yet today. Here is the country school for district number four in Varick on Route 332 at the corner of Route 96. What it looked like, top picture, and what that same building looks like today. You will note that the roof has literally been raised to add a full second story to the original country school. 
Similarly, you see the original country school building for Varick District Number 9, the school building, by the way, that my father attended. And in below, you will see how that building has been moved about one mile and became a private residence with an enclosed porch added. Here is an example of how a country school building has evolved into a private residence with much added on to it. This was Varick District Number 2, commonly known as the Miller Di School District, and it was located on 414, about one mile south of the hamlet of Fayette in the town of Varick. It was not unusual to have pictures of school students taken standing outside the building, and this is one of such typical pictures. This one has a special meaning for me because my mother is shown in this picture. She is in the middle row, the third lady from the left, with the uh, t ties of cloth into her hair. This picture was taken about 1926. Some of our country schools have been maintained as models of country schools for people, especially school students today, to visit and enjoy. One of these is Fayette District Number 4, the McDougal Schoolhouse, that now sits on the property of the Romulus Central School District for a good 20 years. This is a view of the interior of that building. The furnishings are not original, but are of the time period, and so give us a pretty good idea of what the school interior looked like. This is another view of the interior of that same school building. You will notice how the chair seat becomes behind it the desktop for the person sitting behind. Here we have a picture of an old style lunch pail, quite different from lunch pails that even I used when I was going to school. For drinking water, here's the water bucket. I think you can understand it would hardly meet current public health standards. On one of the walls is this sampler helping to learn the letters of the alphabet. Although technically not a country school as we commonly think of them, there was for many years, a girls' school in the hamlet of Romulus that became known as the Romulus Female Seminary. Today, it can be visited at the Genesee Country Village in Mumford, New York. Shown here is a picture of the seminary when it stood just north of the Romulus Presbyterian Church. This is an interior view as it looks presently at Genesee Country Village. Note how the room is somewhat divided into different areas for specific kinds of learning. The teacher's desk is in the foreground. What were teachers paid? What was expected of them? In the next few slides, we'll get some idea of that. Shown here are the 1899 contracts for two different teachers in Ovid District Number 1. At top left, Elizabeth Purdy was to be paid $35 a month for the teaching year. At the bottom right, Ella McDonald was to be paid $40 a month. There wasn't a teacher's union to establish uniform pay for teachers depending upon their experience and level of education. In this next slide, you see 
contracts for Hector Number no. 5, which was a joint school district with Lodi, in 1933 and 1934. Ruth Van Fleet was to be paid $25 a week. I have included this slide of a teacher contract from a country school in Iowa in 1905. The teacher was to be paid $38 a month. The contract, if you look carefully, also spelled out that the teacher was to, quote, do all janitor work without extra compensation. And that was commonly true. Now to look at some of the Typical rules for teachers in country schools about 1900. They were expected to live in the community in which they were employed. They were expected to take residence with local citizens that would provide room and board. They were required to spend weekends in the community unless permission otherwise was granted by the chairman of the local board of education. Teachers were expected to ch attend church each Sunday and to take an active part, particularly in choir and Sunday school work. Dancing, card playing, and the theater were considered works of the devil that led to gambling, immoral climate, and influence, and they were not to be tolerated as actions by teachers. Community plays were given annually and teachers were expected to participate in them. When teachers, female teachers were laundering their petticoats and what we would call unmentionables, it is best to dry them in a flour sack or pillowcase so they wouldn't be seen. Any teacher who smoked cigarettes, used liquor in any form, frequented a pool or public hall, or in the case of men, got shaved in a barber shop, or for women, bobbed her hair, had her hair dyed, wore short skirts, and had undue use of cosmetics, would not be tolerated. Continuing on, teachers were not to marry or keep company with a man friend during the week except as an escort for church services. Loitering in ice cream parlors, drugs store, drug stores, and so on was prohibited. Purchasing or reading the Sunday supplement on the Sabbath was not to be tolerated. Discussing political views or party choice was not advisable. Men teachers may take one evening each week for courting purposes or two evenings a week if they go to church regularly. After 10 hours in the school building, the teacher should spend the remaining time of the day, when not sleeping of course, reading the Bible or other good books. Women teachers who marry or engage in other unseemly conduct would be dismissed. Every teacher should lay aside a good portion of his pay or her pay so that in declining years, the person, the former teacher, would not be a burden on society. In this one country school, the teacher who performs his labors faithfully and without fault for five or more years will be given an increase of 25 cents a week in his or her pay, providing the Board of Education approves. Now, what were teachers expected to do as daily chores over and beyond the teaching itself? In 1872 in Illinois, teachers were expected to fill the lamps each day and clean the chimneys bring in a bucket of water and a coal scuttle full for the day's heating for that day's session. The teacher was expected to cut the quill pens carefully 
maybe whittling the nubs to the individual taste of the pupils, meaning that maybe some pupils wanted a broader line than others. The teacher was expected to sweep the floor every day after school and scrub it with hot, soapy water every week. The teacher was expected to make sure the chalkboards were cleaned every day, as were the erasers. And the teacher was expected to arrive at the school building, the country school, every day in cold weather early enough so that the fire could be started so as to have a warm classroom when the students arrive. Now to get an idea of some of the textbooks. Shown first, you see some of the reading books in the McGuffey Reader Series, a very popular series, along with the New England Primer. This next slide actually shows a reading book that was a New England primer. Here you see a close-up of two pages from an elementary grade spelling book. Note the spelling words near the top of both pages with illustrations to help with understanding. Here are some reading books. It's important to remember that most students in the country schools would probably never in their adult life travel very far away, especially to foreign countries. So these reading books help them to learn things about other countries. Here's still some more early grades textbooks. Note at the right the poem and pictures to help students learn their numbers. In this slide, notice how the pictures provide visual information to help the students learn numbers. Here is a picture from a music book. Even the music had very important, uh, shall we say, learning focus on what was proper action. And here are some pages from a geography book. I love the title of this poetical geography book. Students were even instructed carefully as to the proper way to sit in their seat. At right, a guide you, you see to the letters of the alphabet, both capitalized and not capitalized, as well as how to pronounce each letter. Now, the country schools were required to support and report annually to the New York State Education Department. And I'm going to show you an example of the report for 1850, 1848, excuse me, for the town of Fayette. You will note that teachers were typically young. Some had very little teaching experience. As a matter of fact, only eight of the teachers had taught more than one year. You will also note that male teachers were paid more than female teachers. How expensive was it to operate these country schools? Here's an 1898 school year budget for Fayette Country School number 14. It doesn't seem like a lot of money, but we need to use standards in the 1890s and not 2019 standards to judge those amounts. 
What was a typical school day and year like? In 1898, for this Fayette District number 14, the school year had 171 days of instruction. The teacher, in addition, was going to be paid for four days of vacation and five days of attendance at a teacher's institute. At that time, the teachers were just typically high school graduates, and they were allowed to teach in small country schools without any normal school training beyond that, as we called the school education training. But they did have to go to a five-week session held during the school year for those that did not complete a full normal school education. You will notice that not all of the children attended not all of the children in the community or area attended. And that was because there was not a compulsory education law at that point for children under the age of eight. This country school served 20 families, and the country schools were located so that children wouldn't have to walk, the furthest ones that had to walk wouldn't have to walk too great a distance. This particular schoolhouse was valued at $700. There were separate privies for male and female students. Although it was required by state law, this school did not give instruction in physiology and personal hygiene. The typical school day probably started at 9 a.m., and there was a 15-minute intermission in the morning. There was one hour break for lunch that would include recess, giving children a chance to blow off some of the steam from having to be so quiet and orderly throughout the morning. The afternoon session then typically went from 1 to 4. In this particular school, the youngest students were along the north wall. The oldest students sat at double desks along the north wall. Along the west wall was the teacher's desk and blackboard. The classroom operated in an almost mechanical session. Students receiving instruction from the teacher would probably move up to sit right close to the teacher's desk. The other students, the older students, would be working at their own desk. They had to do a lot of work on their own. When they were with the teacher, it was probably getting drilled to make sure that they were learning the things that they should have been learning on their own. Friday afternoons was a time for cultural learning in the arts, music, and natural sciences, frequently with a walk weather permitting to see some of the nature. What about discipline? I'm going to give you this example from a Mr. Covert at the McDougal School. One time he made five boys crawl around the wooden floor for three hours on their hands and knees as retribution for their babyish behavior in throwing ink. When the students got home, the parents noticed their sons had worn holes in their knees of their pants. And as one student at that country school remarked later in her adult life, Mr. Covert didn't remain at McDougal School long. Another example of an unusual discipline measure. A male student confronted a young male, female teacher, picking her up by the legs and placing her atop the burning coal stove. I can just imagine that some of the male students might have been bigger than the very young female student. What did the teacher do? The teacher had the boy's sister trip him as he tried to flee the country school building. 
The teacher then took the boy by the ear across the street to where he, she knew his father worked. And the father was a school board member. And you can just imagine the discipline that the father gave to this son when he got home. Former students could remember almost fondly some 40 years later of their country school experience of throwing snowballs and spit wads. Common discipline measures were putting the misbehaving child in the corner on a dunce stool or isolating the child in the cloakroom. Here at top left, you see that infamous dunce cap. In some country schools, it was actually used. It was placed on the head of the student who did something really stupid or wrong. In the picture at bottom left, you see the infamous female teacher maintaining discipline by carrying the stick that could be used to reach over to a student who was daydreaming or misbehaving in the slightest way. Now, there were some interesting student pranks. At Halloween time, the school bell in one country school was tipped and filled with manure to greet whoever rang the bell the next morning. Another time, a buggy was dismantled and reassembled on top of the pitched roof of the country schoolhouse. A common practice was pulling the wings off from flies and then putting the buzzing flies down the backs of students' shirts or dresses. Another common practice was throwing ink. I can hardly think about that. I really don't even want to think about it. A famous song titled School Days provides some rather fond memories of the country school experience. School days, school days, dear old golden rule days. Reading and writing and arithmetic taught to the tune of the hickory stick. I have a framed copy of this sheet music hanging in my living room. Of course, I was a classroom teacher for 32 years. This map of just a few years ago provides locations of various country schools in which Finger Lakes residents have tried to preserve their country school so that people and youth today can get an idea of what country schools were like. I hope you have enjoyed this piece of fing our Finger Lakes history. I especially hope that those of you who actually attended a country school when you were growing up has found this program to bring back some fond and not some fond memories of your country school experience.